student um, governor, Kim O'Neill, has some input to this, and Anna Howell and Garrett um, from the Harvey Society. Um, basically, what this is about, um, the, the president of our alumni association, George Peacock, when he was asked, what, uh, what are your three priorities for your two years of presence? He said, students, students, and students. They said, no, you've got to give me three, and he said, students, students, students. So the idea came out of a committee I'm on that looks at, at uh, legacy giving, which is obviously you're not into. Uh, it's in your will, leaving stuff to Georgetown. And the students said we would like to hear from alumni about practical matters, like financial stuff. Like maybe freshmen in, in college should think about uh, and learn how to balance their checkbook. Um, now, my, I am not a financial person. Any MBAs in here? Financial planners? Oh, you're an MBA? I'm getting my MBA. Oh, you're getting your MBA. Okay, so you can't ask questions. <laughs> um, uh, so I have no experience in this except I ran a practice, uh, private practice for 40 years. I ran the child psychiatry department here and knew about budgets, which I knew nothing about before I started. Um, and basically, I used to give a talk to the graduating child fellows just on practical issues going into practice. So that's sort of what this is going to be about. Um, okay. So why do we do this? Um, ben Franklin once said that education is the best investment you could ever make. Um, I have a feeling you guys have made a very large investment in your medical school. <laughs> uh, and when you get out as a resident and then in practice, you think you're making a lot of money, right? You work very hard, you sacrifice, you've got loans, you work 24 hours a day or whatever. Uh, the trouble is when you graduate and you get into residency, you may make a little more money, and then you get into practice, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, there's not that much money, okay? One of the reasons is you may be paying 60% taxes. So when you think you're really rich and you got a lot of money to spend, and psychologically you want to buy stuff and get a Jaguar and a boat and whatever, uh, it's not as much as you think it is. Um, so it's one pearl is it's not what you make, it's what you spend and what you save. And you need to think about that as you go along. I'm sure in medical school you budget and do things, but that's also true when you get out into practice. Um, in fact, um, our MBA student, okay, if you save a dollar a day in 30 years, how much money do you have? Take a guess. Hey, come on, you're an MBA guy. Dollar a day for 30 days? For 30 years. 30 years? I don't, know, I don't have a calculator on One million dollars. Okay? The time value of money and compound interest. Okay? Investment. So you start early. Okay, but the other thing is, it's important not just to think about money and happiness. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of uh, weeks ago about wealth and happiness. Um, and it was very interesting because as a psychiatrist, what they talked about, there's two kinds of happiness. And there's a happiness from things and material things, like getting the new iPad and you get a kick out of that, and that'll last for a couple of days, a couple of weeks. And then the other kind of wealth is the wealth that you get from experiences, and that's relationships with people and events. So if you go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and you do that with people, that sticks with you, and that gives you much more happiness than maybe the iPad or the iPhone that you get, the new i6 or whatever the number is at this point. Um, so it's important, um, and also being Georgetown and Men for Others and all that stuff, that you know, a job gives you a living, and uh, giving to people uh, gives you a life. So it's really about the relationships and the other stuff, it's not just the money itself. So. All right, so some practical things. Malpractice. Um, malpractice. You haven't worried about that in medical school, right? Um, when you get malpractice, get the most you can, you can cover it. Usually you get it through a group. There's two kinds. Anybody know the two kinds of malpractice? Okay, there's occurrence and there's claims made. Occurrence is, and I'm insured by X, Y, or Z company, and when it happens, okay, if I was insured during that five years that I had that insurance company, they pay for the rest of their life, my life, okay? Um, claims made, and that's usually much more expensive because you're covering them for you know, an eternity. Claims made insurance is usually cheaper, and that's what most people are writing nowadays, and that basically is you uh, have it only during the period you're covered, then afterwards you're not covered, okay? So if you, in, in year X, get sued, 
in year 10 when you only have it for the five years and you need a tail policy. A lot of insurances, what they'll do is cover that tail policy for free. You may have to buy that unless you've been with them for a certain number of years. Okay. Important thing, and you've probably heard this even as freshmen, I would hope, um, or M1s. Uh, you document, document, document. It's the most, that's the second best thing to defend against the lawsuit. First best thing, I'm a psychiatrist, talk to the patient, communicate with the patient, be empathic, be honest, be sympathetic, be empathetic. Now that doesn't mean, you know, well, I really screwed up, whatever, but if something bad happens, you talk about it with the patient, discuss it. That's the best defense. The second best defense is to document. Um, the other thing is, if you have any question at all about something that's going on with the patient, and especially if the patient says, well, you know, I'm going to sue you, or you know, this is going to destroy our lives, talk to your insurance, who will give you a malpractice attorney right away in your state. Okay? And so if there's any question at all, get help and get advice right away. Second thing with that is, you get a subpoena, and you, no, no lawyers here, right? What, when you get a subpoena, what does that mean? Oh, there, you can leave. You get a subpoena, I got the subpoena doctor, got this patient, you got to send me your records. Huh? You've got to send records. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. You call your malpractice attorney and your insurance. <laughs> yeah, trapped it. Okay. And the reason is, just because you have a subpoena, you have to find out. There's confidentiality, there's release of information, there's permission, consent. Okay. So you ask the malpractice guy right away, I need to do this. Okay. So. Subpoena doesn't necessarily mean you have to do it right away. The first thing is you call them a practice. I got the subpoena, what do I do with it? And they deal with it. And they deal with the judge, they deal with the lawyer. Okay. Um, okay, next thing. Most of you are probably going to be working for a group or a hospital. That's the way medicine is going. I did private practice for 40 years by myself. I was my secretary, my phone person, my accountant. Um, so when you do it, you get a contract from the university, or you get a contract from the group. What's the first thing you do? Call your lawyer. What was that? <laughs> what is that? Okay, very good, you call a lawyer, okay? The reason is, you want to look at things like benefits, your hours, whatever, but you want to look at one big thing, which is a debatable point legally, and that's a non-compete clause. If you go to Boone, North Carolina, like one of our fellows did, and you're in a group practicing psychiatry, and then you decide after a year, I don't like this group or whatever, and you, you didn't read the thing or have a lawyer look at it, and it says in there you can't open up an office within 200 miles. Okay, get a lawyer. I'm saying that a lot. They don't like lawyers. They got three brother-in-laws that are lawyers. George just has tons of lawyers, but don't be afraid to get a lawyer. The other thing to do when you get out in practice, and you, who knows about the MATCH program? Any of the juniors know about the MATCH program? The alum, they have a bunch of programs for you. The MATCH program is alums throughout the country, med, med alums, Let's say you're going into orthopedics in New York. They will match you up, okay, once you match, with somebody who may be at the same hospital, who may be an orthopedic surgeon, who you can talk to, who you can relate to. You can say, where do I live? Where do I not get killed? How do I get to work? Where do I go to eat? Okay, and what's this hospital like? And what's the orthopedics like? It may not always be the match for the specialty. And then for undergrads and for med students, there's also a thing called Hoya Gateway. Anybody know about that? Okay, Hoya Gateway is about 900 or 1,000 alums, um, maybe five, George, do you know how many of this? How many alums? Alums in Hoya Gateway, 500 or 1,000? No, 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 up to just shy of 1,000 right Okay, now. there's 1,000 alums, and this is a new program, this is for all schools, not just undergrad, med school, whatever. If you're a freshman and you want to hook up with somebody and find and talk to an alum who is a child psychiatrist, you join a gateway, you put your name in, you put your stuff, and then you go in a profile. And if you like basketball, I like basketball. You can see if that's there, okay? To talk about, so it's not just when you, like you're getting towards getting a job and getting out and being a resident, it can be from the beginning, you can get help. So there's, and there's 170,000 alums out there that are really ready, willing, and able. Um, okay, general things to do when you get out in life. How many people are married? Anybody children? Okay, you need a will, okay? Oh, oh, Mackenzie. Okay. Does your father have a will? Mackenzie? 
Doris, do you have a will? Okay. I guess I leave it all to the other children. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason you need a will is when I went to get my will, and all my kids and all the lawyers, especially Babbitt, doing this, in the state of Virginia, I found out something interesting. You need somebody in that state to know. Them. In the state of Virginia, and I don't know if this is still true, if I didn't have a will and I died in test state or whatever that word is, the yes. will, um, two thirds of my estate would go automatically to my children and one third to my wife. Okay, so there's little quirks like that. So you need a will. You need to think about that. And you, nobody wants to think about dying and everything, but you need to think of those things. Okay, will advanced medical um, uh, directive, living will. You've probably seen those, heard about those. You need to sign those. You need to sign a financial or fiduciary thing where somebody could ex execute your finances if you get sick or something happens. Uh, there's simple laws. You got to make sure if you want a son or a daughter or an uncle to be able to. Go and talk to the doctor in the hospital. Okay, we're physicians and we deal with that on the other side. You need that for yourselves. Um, you also need beneficiaries. Uh, MBA students, sorry I'm picking on you. Do you have a name so you don't call you an MBA student? Omar. Omar, okay. Um, it's good if you have a retirement plan, like an IRA retirement plan, and you leave that to your state, right? Okay, good. You, you know that I'm asking that. Okay. You need to have beneficiaries. If you have a retirement plan, okay, and you leave it to your state, you lose something called the ability to have the children, for instance, as not with spouse, but with the children. If you just leave it to the estate, the estate has to pay taxes within um, five years, they have to take it out. If not, you could roll over and they can take that over their lifetime. Okay. So another time, you need to maybe talk to a lawyer, how you set that up with your IRA account. Uh, I, I just changed one the other day that I forgot it was in my state, which wouldn't have been. Um, okay. How much money do you need to keep in the bank for emergencies? Somebody else. How much money, how much money, cash or liquid stuff do you need in the bank for emergencies? Ten thousand. Huh? Ten thousand? Uh, no. Six months to a year's salary. Used to be said three months to six months. Okay? And that's if something happens, you ain't working. All right? Um, what other things do you need? You need health insurance. You need disability insurance, and I don't think maybe George knows this. You're much more likely to be disabled in a year than to die by like 5, 10, 20 times, depending on your age. And people don't think about it. So look at the disability insurance, which usually is up to a maximum of 60% of your salary. Okay, what kind of life insurance? People need life insurance when they're young? Why do you get life insurance like when you're young? It's cheap. It's much cheaper. Cheaper, right? Uh, I've got some relatives, they got married, didn't have life insurance. Oops, somebody developed ulcerative colitis. Somebody developed diabetes. All of a sudden it becomes very expensive. Okay. So you get it when you're young and you're healthy and it's cheaper. Second point, which do you want? Whole life or universal insurance, which is a good investment? Or do you want term life insurance? Anna? I don't know the difference. Okay. Whole life is kind of like an investment. At least the insurance people that sell it to you try to tell you this. And you get insurance, and you get $10,000 insurance. They say, boy, this builds up dividends. It has cash value. You know, in 20 years, you get the $10,000 back. And if you die, you get $10,000. And that costs about $500. Okay. Term life is different. You buy it for a term of 10, 20, 30 years, and you get it renewable. And what happens is, at the end of the term, it's gone. Term insurance for $500, you get a million dollars, approximately. Okay. And if insurance is really to protect you and your family and your relatives and whatever, what you want to do is get the insurance, the term insurance. And there may be other things about um, how it's done and you have trust for it. But in general, you want that because by the time you are maybe 50 or 60, you know, 20, 30 years later, Hopefully your retirement fund's built up and you don't need the insurance to take care of people. You have retirement funds to do that. Um, another kind of insurance. Who knows what umbrella insurance is? Kind of. It's um, insurance that covers after your limit on your primary insurance is basically kind of um, maxed out. Sort of. Yes, yeah, sort of. What happens? Okay, you've got auto insurance and home insurance and whatever and liability for your home. What happens if a good old doctor's out on Wednesday and he hits a golf ball, hits somebody in the head, and they say, Doc, 
I've got brain damage. I'm going to sue you. Oops. Where is that covered? That's why you have umbrella insurance. It covers that kind of stuff. And a million, two million, three million dollars of that is relatively cheap. Uh, but as a physician, you're going to be marked by people. And if you're playing golf and you hit somebody, they may know you're a doctor. So umbrella insurance. Um, there's a debate about long-term health insurance and whether you need that or don't need that. Um, I didn't do that because I've got enough of my retirement that would cover sort of emergencies for stuff. But that's a de decision you need to make and you should think about. Um, all right, um, buying versus renting, and I'm sure George will have thoughts about this. You move to an area, and what you got? Anybody own a house? Oh, nobody owns the house. What? Okay, we own the house. All right. Uh, you move to an area as a resident, and the first thing you do is buy a house because it's a good investment, right? Well, do you know if you're going to stay there after three years of your residency? Doesn't do anything. So you want to find out the neighborhood what's going on. Uh, buying and renting. A Home, okay, is not an investment. My father taught me this, right? Everybody thinks about, mm, put money, buy real estate, whatever. You need to live somewhere, okay? And you need to live there. And what happened in 2007 if you bought a house, let's say a $500,000 house, and what happened over the next few years around the country? How much did it go down? 42%. So let's say a $100,000 house, and you put 20% down, you have an $80,000 mortgage, and let's say it goes down to 62% or 38%, right? What happens? What can the bank do if you've got a mortgage? Okay, you're under the cost of what they've got their money out for, they can call the loan. Now, there's debate about buying or renting or whatever, and which is that there was actually Michelle Singletary in the Post a couple weeks ago had an article which really made the case for, well, look at this over time. It's supposed to be you get tax deductions and get all this stuff, it's a good investment, but they don't look at what would happen if you didn't do that in your rent. And so there may be pros and cons that, so it's not an automatic. But it shouldn't be an investment. Most people like me that are old bought houses when they were cheap and they made a lot of money. And you can go into real estate, and some people are very good at that and do that, but for your, it's a home, okay? It's not an investment. And you need to think of it. Maybe a great investment turn out that way, but you don't want to think of it that way. Um, okay, so you want to go and you're out in practice five years and you decide you want to buy a house, right? And the real estate agent says, here's this offer you're going to make on this house. It's a great house. And, eh, be careful, you don't want to put an inspection because everybody's trying to get this house and just sign this offer here, okay? What happens when the offer is brought to the seller and the seller signs it? It's done. Huh? I have the house. You have the house. So is it an offer on a house? It is a contract, legal and binding contract, right? So. When you get that standard contract from the real estate agent, and he says, this is a standard contract, you know, don't want any lawyers looking at this because they'll mess it up and put stuff in here. It's probably the biggest thing, the biggest purchase you'll make most people in their lives. Okay, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. You bring that to a lawyer. Okay, even though the real estate said, this is standard. It's standard because what happens is, it's standard. The first person to get their money with a deposit is the real estate agent. There was a very brilliant surgeon here was around my time who was one of the first people doing laparoscopic surgery. His wife were very nice and they were looking in Arlington for a house. And this uh, unethical real estate agent had him put two offers in on two different houses because it was a very competitive market and they wanted to get one of them. Well, came back signed, right? And they had two houses. And luckily, they were able to get a lawyer and sue the guy for being unethical. Okay, but it's a contract. Okay, it's not an offer on a house. Uh, okay. If you do buy a house, I would get a fixed long-term mortgage. I wouldn't get an arm. Those are deadly. Those are the things that are adjustable. And back then, oh, this is cheaper. It's two percent, four percent. My payments half. Oops. And what happens if that shoots up? Okay. Uh, Retirement funds. Um, how much if you put a dollar away a day? How much is it worth in 30 years? Do you remember? That? Million dollars. Three, a million dollars. Okay. And give or take a few. Um, 
A rule of thumb is you need 85% of your, re your, your salary when you retire at 65. The other thing is almost everybody recommends that one of the first things you do besides paying off your loan, one of the things about happiness, one of the negative things about happiness is you have debt. So, sorry about that. You want to try to get rid of the debt. Um, but after the debt and after having some emergency, you want to though, put everything you can into a retirement fund. And most of the time, again, if you're working for a group, if you're working for <coughs> a hospital, uh, they will have plans. Georgetown is a great plan, TIA Craft. When I was here, I got paid peanuts, but they put in 12% of my salary. I put in three and an additional five. So on my Georgetown salary, even though it was very low, that built up over 30 years. Uh, you want to put in um, the max that you can, especially get the max that they're matching. Like uh, some of my kids, their company, if you put in six, they put in 6% and they'll match it up to a certain point. There are two basic kinds of retirement issues. Um, one is traditional IRA or SEP. Um, basically those, if, let's say you have a private practice, you can put up to 20% of your income, up to $50,000, uh, I think it's 51 or 52. You could put that away. Okay. Advantage of those traditional things is you get a tax deduction. Okay. And you can deduct that so you don't pay tax on it. So that's put away. The disadvantage of that is when you're 70 and a half years of age, okay, and you need to decide this because if you're going out and getting a job and doing things, you need to decide this. What happens is at 70 and a half, you have to start taking that out. And since you didn't pay tax there, it gathers tax free. So it's amazing, 30 years. With, but you pay full income tax at the end. There's no capital gains if you have stocks in there, and you pay the full income tax. Okay. The other is the newer thing called the Roth, which is only available to certain people. Um, and now one of my son's companies, they're starting to offer that as a part in the 301 or whatever. 401k. What is it? 401k. 401k, thank you. And some will do allow some or part of the Roth and match it. A Roth is different, and there are certain rules about whether you could do that or not with whatever income you have. But if you can do that, or what some people that are older like me do, if I have a low income year, I can put some of my IRA, transfer it into the Roth, pay taxes on it, and then let it continue to grow tax-free. The advantage, disadvantage of the Roth is you don't get a tax deduction. The advantage of the Roth is you don't ever have to take it out. Okay, so for my kids, if I have a little bit in the Roth, I'm leaving that there forever that will grow forever tax-free. And when you take it out, there's no taxes. You paid the taxes on a little bit, whatever, 30 years ago, and that grew over the 30 years. So there's a debate about, maybe George can address that, about the advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, okay, is this getting boring? No, yes? <laughs> Mackenzie, are you sleeping? Okay, she's playing games, good. Um, all right. Let me see, good fun. TI and CREF, if you're with a university hospital, or TI and CREF is one of the largest retirement things and one of the most secure and most conservative in the, in the country. Um, as I said, Georgetown used to put in 12%, I don't know what it is now, but it used to be the highest in the country. 12%, I put in three and another five. Um, a, a good fund is Vanguard funds, have very low fees. Um, and what, what you need to, the other thing you need to know is, uh, oh, the MBA student, Omar, sorry to pick on you. Is it good to have a mutual fund? Where is it better to have it? In a retirement fund, okay, or in a, just your regular, like, investment stuff? Where, where do you put the mutual fund? I'd say investment. Huh? Investment. Well, why is that? Better bang for your buck. Bang for your buck. But the other one gathers tax free, though. All right? Well, you know what happens? If you have a mutual fund, okay, and the mutual fund loses 50% that year, but the mutual fund company, they determine that they're going to give you capital gains and give you money, even though you lost 50%, guess what you do? If it's in your regular investment thing, you pay taxes on that. Okay? If that is in your retirement fund, Okay, and they declare it. That's all tax-free. You don't pay tax on it at that point. You'll just pay tax at the end when you pull it out of his income. Okay, so that's one thing to just watch out for in terms of we and George may have some. This is going to be interesting. I'm going first. He's going second. And I'm explaining how I'm getting set up for this. Uh, investments. Um, how much money do you need? You need money in the bank six to twelve months. 
Uh, you want to maximize your retirement. You want to try to pay off your debt. And I do have um, a little handout from the Wall Street Journal for people with tax breaks for college grads. It's also, if you're like, finishing med school, just some things to look at. But after you do that, what is your best investment? Come on, what's the best investment after you get your six to 12 months? Your education that you just paid for, like it's gonna be like, you know, $250,000 or whatever or more. Okay, that's your best investment. Um, after that, okay, and the other thing is you're lucky in med school. Remember Dean Mitchell when the, the economy went like tanked? And I said, well, see, that must be killing admissions. Who would wanna pay all this money to go to med school? Do you know what happened to the applications to med school? They went up because you guys will get jobs. Okay, not like a lot of the other people going around. So your best investment, okay, is your education and your, your job is your best investment. As long as you keep working and the more you work, the more money you have and the more money you can distribute. Uh, I believe that you diversify things. With younger people, I think you buy stocks, and we'll get into a little about that. And you need some fixed income a little bit. But stocks throughout time have gone up, and I'm sure you'll disagree with this, uh, some 8%. And the key is not just the stock, but the dividends. So I'll get into the stocks. I tend to buy and tended to buy things like McDonald's where my kids were going all the time. Buy what you know, buy what people tell you. My computer son told me that he heard Steve Jobs was going out back to some little company out in California called Apple. And he was going to go back there and he told me to buy it at $8.24. And I bought a little, I should have bought a lot. Okay. Uh, my accountant was in a uh, study for hepatitis. Okay, and she said, do you know about this company killing me? I said, no, I never heard of that. Well, I was in the study and I'm cured. Okay, there's a 90% cure. Okay. Uh, when I first got out into practice, uh, Concerta, which is a, a stimulant, had a special delivery thing. It was like a long acting thing. And there were patches for um, Daytron and these other things where you wear a patch. So all of a sudden, one day, I'm reading, where, who makes that stuff? That stuff was made by a company called Alza, which blossomed and blew up and got bought out by someone else. So the point of the things is, you know certain things, this is not insider trading, you know certain things, do things you know. I went to Seattle once and went to Starbucks, and I said, hmm, this guy Schultz has got an idea to get the experience. That's why you pay three bucks for a cup of coffee. So talk to people, read things. You know, I read the Wall Street Journal of Money, it's sort of fun to do that. Again, it doesn't give you happiness, but at least you learn to manage things. Uh, I think if you do invest in stocks, you dollar cost average. You don't just dump everything in because it could be the next day that's when it falls 20%. Okay? And you dividend reinvest and you think of long term. I'm sure George will have opinions about that, right, George? Yeah. Uh, you can't time the market. You have to think long term. People think they're going to go in and out and do it. And options and all this stuff I never understood. Um, the other thing is, and there's, just, there's an article on estate planning since I'm getting old. Um, who knows what, the, what happens if you die and you own a house or you own stock? Let's say the house was $10,000, now it's a million dollars. And you own stock, it was $10,000, and now it's a million dollars. What happens when you die and your kids get all that stuff? Anybody hear a thing called a stepped up basis? What they do is, and, and accountants I've talked to, and when the Georgetown Legacy Society does estate planning, this will probably always remain. You step up the basis. So if I die, let's say my, my parents died and left the house, okay? And the house they bought for $20,000 is now worth $250,000. When I get that, I get a stepped up basis. So if I sell the house, my cost basis for capital gains is $250,000. Same with stocks. The cost basis is $250,000 as opposed to $10,000. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of where you put things. All right. Um, a little bit more here. Almost done. Okay, time value of money. Who do you think said compound interest is the greatest invention in the universe? Einstein. Very good. Very good. And he was dyslexic too, and he still was able to do that. Okay. Um, a dollar, right? If you buy a Dunkin' Donuts, which my daughter went to Boston and loved Dunkin' Donuts because it's all they drink up there. If you buy a dollar Starbucks versus 
I mean, a dollar Dunkin' Donuts versus two or three dollar things. Okay. So you've got all this money, right? What do you need to do? Anybody do a budget? Now, budget, you think, oh, that means you got to really cut out stuff and do things. Okay. If you're going to treat a patient, you go in the room and say, this is the treatment plan? No, what do you do first? You diagnose the patient. And how do you diagnose the patient? Which room are we in? Proctor Harvey, you talk to the patient, you get information, you get facts. You need to do the same with your finances. Okay? An example of that in terms of making a budget, which means just figuring out what is fixed and what's discretionary. Because you can't change the fix, but you can change the Starbucks to the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, it's important to do, in psychiatry, there's two things I think about where doing that's important. One is, Somebody comes in and says, I want to lose weight, doc. And the first thing you do is say, okay, go home and write down everything you eat for a week, everything you put in your mouth. And what happens? You eat less. You got it. You eat less. Just being coming where, if you have an obsessive compulsive disorder patient and they're washing their hands 30 times a day for three minutes, you get a little book and you say, this week, every time you do that, you write in hands, 10 o'clock, 20 pieces. Well, it's the same with finances, okay? You wouldn't diagnose a patient and treat a patient without. If you figure out your budget, it isn't to, well, I'm going to figure out this budget so I don't spend any money. What do I need to spend and where are their choices I'm making? Okay. Now, the other thing is taxes. It's good to know about taxes and tax deductions, but it's my accountant who did my first tax thing when I was a resident and said, you are in the poverty level, you're getting a rebate or whatever it was. <laughs> You're in inspiring income. <laughs> and this guy did like Deloitte and he had all these multi-million dollar crimes. He thought it was pretty funny. But there's, what he told me was there's no 100% tax deduction. Okay? You don't do things for tax deduction reasons. Um, that's one thing you think about. Um, but if you donate something, you're donating because you want to donate it, and also you get some tax deductions with it. But you, that's not the only reason you do it for the tax deduction. Because it's not 100%. You're still you know, giving away 70% of it. Okay, so my father used to say, work hard and have fun every day. And uh, a home is to live in and it's not an investment. Um, there's been a big debate recently on Facebook about passion. And uh, did you see this, George? Where doing things for passion is a bad thing. Well. They say that you really work hard and then you develop the passion and then you develop the success and you feel good. I still think if you have a passion and that is what you like to do and it's your job, then it's really not work. I mean, I found that with child psychiatry. I love playing with kids and doing stuff. Um, the other thing I would suggest to you going out into the world is no matter what specialty you go in, pick something very special to think about and become an expert in. And I'll tell you a story. When I was a child psychiatry fellow, I graduated. I was in first year of practice. I had a 12-year-old kid that was very depressed. I thought he had OCD. Um, and he needed to be hospitalized at the Psych Institute. And when he was hospitalized, my former supervisor said to me, Bill, this kid has Tourette's syndrome. And I said, literally, what's that? Because back in the early 70s, nobody knew about that. It wasn't on TV. It wasn't talked about. And so what I did was, I read about it, found out about it, and we established a clinic here, which is the first clinic south of New York. Um, so, and that was like 40% of my practice. So I knew that that was something that people would come to me with, and I enjoyed doing it, it was fun. So pick out something, and no matter what the specialty is, pick out something that's a little bit different, a little bit special, and sort of excites you. Um, I just got a couple things. I would recommend a book to you. Uh, anybody know who Ted Leonsis is? Who's Ted Leon? He's the owner of the, the Wizards and Capitals, right? Wizards, Capitals, Mystics, Monuments, Sports, Verizon Center, where Georgetown pays him rent to play. He's also on the board of directors here, okay. And he also is the founder of AOL, okay, when AOL was like it. That was like one of the first things. I would recommend to you, there's a book that he wrote um, called The Business of Happiness. It's a fascinating book. It's about his life. He was a poor Greek guy. Who, some guy said, why don't you go to Georgetown? And he got here and he said, you know, I learned that to summer was a verb. I always in the summer worked in, you know, the drugstore or worked in the whatever. And it came to Georgetown and everybody was summering. They were summering in Newport. They were summering in Rhode Island. I was working. I never knew it was a verb. But it's an excellent book. 
Um, and it talks about the business of happiness and how the two things really go together. The other book I'd recommend to you is, has anybody heard of a book called The Healing of America? Okay, it's by T.R. Reed, R-E-I-D, he's not the Senator Reed, but this guy did a study of six Western countries and looked at um, their health care and our health care. And I think one of the things coming out of here is you have to be advocates for your patients and advocates for health care. That's the other thing. So. Okay, so don't forget the Jesuit motto, men and women for others. By giving, you get a life. Um, and, um, and the other thing is, as physicians, people are going to hit on you for money. Uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good. I hope it didn't drive you away with your question. Thanks for coming. Um, if it sounds too, bit, too good to be true, it is too And, you know, physicians are marks. I got a deal. I got a special deal for you. Be careful. All right, now I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, who I came first, and I, I didn't show him because he's going to talk about <coughs> why all this was baloney. Okay. Uh, let me see. Three simple rules of investing. Why everything you heard about investing is wrong and what to do instead. And George is the president of the um, Alumni Association. He's a financial person. Uh, and his thing has been students. So this is why we decided to try this and see what happens. Do I need to be mic? Yes. All right. Well, maybe they don't hear you. You can't criticize it. We did not talk about what Bill was going to say in advance. <laughs> Um, and I'm actually surprised by how much I won't disagree with him. Um, just to give you some background, uh, I graduated from Georgetown undergrad in 1984, worked for the Alumni Association for three years, uh, and then got into the financial business in 1987. And if you know any market history, I got involved in uh, the finance industry in June of 1987, and it was in October of 1987 that we had, I think, the greatest, to this day, the greatest one-day drop in the stock market. Uh, so that was sort of an eye-opener early on uh, in my career. And I was dealing with people related to a lot of the issues Bill was talking about, budgeting, uh, insurances, life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance didn't exist yet. Still a fairly new product, really, over the last 20 years. And I, I think Bill's right, the jury is still out on uh, whether that's the kind of insurance that people ought to be getting. The, uh, the current thinking seems to be that if you, if you have a net worth under $250,000 or two hundred fifty dollars to $500,000, don't get long-term care insurance. It's too expensive and you're pretty close to the point at which you will get other government benefits. And then if you have a million, million five or more net worth, self-insure. So there's this sort of narrow band uh, of people. And um, it's also, they also just did some new studies that suggested that the incidence of needing long-term care coverage, or I'm sorry, long-term care uh, is much greater than they initially thought, but the duration of needing that care is much shorter. So today's products may not be a good match for it anyway. Not that this, it's probably the least imminent issue for us. <laughs> anyway, um, so dealing, de dealing, dealing with uh, budgetary issues, dealing with the various insurances, wills, as Bill said, uh, one of the things that he mentioned was the, the value of having a will when you have children. One of the issues uh, there is the ability to name the guardian. Right? Uh, what, it, it, that way the court doesn't decide it uh, against your wishes or with being uninformed by your wishes. The other thing is that you can create in your will testamentary trusts that do not exist until you die. And when, when you die, uh, whatever assets you have can go into those trusts and you can appoint trustees, name those trustees again, have that choice, giving the trustee a great deal of flexibility to act in your place uh, with that money for the benefit of your children. And um, if you just leave it without a will, uh, it goes to them, the court supervises it until their age of majority at age 18, but then they get it all. By using a testamentary trust, you can say, well, they'll get maybe one third of it at 25, one third at 30, one third at 35. So they don't come into what might be a lot of money at age 18 and blow it and then it's gone. Uh, so there are different ways to do that. So there, that's when we see a lot of people getting wills and getting insurance uh, is once they have children typically. Or when a couple buys a house uh, because now they both have that liability and they, 
get insurance just to protect the other one uh, in case one of them dies. Uh, and, but Bill's right, I think, on the uh, insurance front, on the life insurance front, that it's not like just going to the store and getting lettuce. Uh, you can't just go in and say, I'd like lettuce, and they give you lettuce. When you go to uh, the uh, uh, get insurance, you apply, and they say, mm -hmm, are you healthy? Uh, and if you're healthy, they'll give it to you with good rates, and you, you know now whether you are or not healthy, but there are any number of things, and you're probably in a better position than really most people in America to understand that bad things happen medically to people, uh, surprising things, and it does change their health status, making them uh, potentially even uninsurable. Uh, so it is a good idea to get insurance, and, and in that case, you're sort of you're anticipating the kinds of insurance that you might need five years out, ten years out, fifteen years out, when you have a family and you have a home and you might want two million dollars. So a lot of times people say, well, if you're you're 24, 25, and you don't have any kids and you're not married, there's no reason for insurance. And technically that's true, but because of the nature of it, it's a little bit like buying an option, right? Uh, it's a little bit of optionality there that you might get a $2 million policy that's a 30-year term uh, limit. So what that means is, let's assume you get a 30-year term insurance policy for a million dollars, and maybe it costs you, let's use Bill's number, $500. That's $500 a year level for 30 years. So you sort of lock in that cost. Uh, so those policies do exist. So I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's ever too early to get some, or even to get a lot. You might, you know, you may not have this dependent right now, uh, but you're really anticipating future dependence. So that's one thing about it. Um, I think I'm. I just want to make sure I cover some of the things you do. Okay, one of the things Bill talked about was whole life, universal life, variable universal life. There are going to be a lot of people that you talk to uh, who will talk about what we would call, broadly speaking, cash value forms of life insurance. That's where you're going to pay a higher premium, but you're going to build up some cash value. And they will talk to you about the tax benefits of, the, of them because all the cash that accumulates within a, an annuity or life insurance contract does grow on a tax-favored basis. It is not taxed year to year. A little bit like an IRA, and some people even sell it as an IRA alternative. The only thing, you know, I, I, this is gonna be a very short period of time, so I'm, I'm not gonna try to teach you anything. I just wanna give you an idea of things to look out for down the road. And one of the things is, is that if you think about insurance, really there's the administrative cost of running an insurance company, and then there are mortality tables. And the insurance company looks at the mortality tables and they say X number of 30 year olds who are healthy are going to die. Therefore, we need to charge all of these people Y so that we, we are able to pay out those two people who are gonna die this year. That's simple. So there's mortality and there's the cost of hiring the people to underwrite and figure out who are the healthy risks, who are not, and what we should charge them and things like that. Um, that's about it. Uh, and that's what term insurance is, essentially. They figure out how many people they're going to have to pay out on and how many people uh, are applying for coverage, and it's just math. Term insurance is going to be the way to go. Just, you're just going to have to uh, trust me on this for at least 98% of you. Um, it, in cash value, will always be made to sound very good. Uh, um, I'm telling you right now, you will in your life think, boy, that sounds like a great deal. It's just not. Um, and usually it's because you're only getting one half of the story. And the other half of the story, and I'll mention a couple other things where it, where it sounds good, but you're only hearing half of the story. Uh, and that it's the other half that really makes a difference. Because everything sounds good when they describe the tax advantages and how you can borrow from policies tax-free. But when you look at what happens when the policy surrenders, it all comes due in ordinary income tax and often a little bit like one of Bill's other examples, uh, you could have uh, withdrawn a million dollars from the policy that maybe you built up over time on a tax-free basis and then when the policy collapses, that full million dollars that you've already spent is taxable income at ordinary income rates. So suddenly you've got no money, you've spent the money and you owe three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in taxes. It's not a good situation. So term will really take care of it. So um, I think I'm I'm gonna talk just for two minutes on budgeting. There's a group, uh, and one of the things that's interesting is that there, um, 
in the last two years, and they're really coming out, it almost feels like one a week, there are more and more online financial advisory firms. Many of them you can control and take care of your finances and get control of your finances and get advice really on your iPhone uh, or, or tablet or something like that. Uh, it remains to be seen there. Most of them are focused primarily on investments right now, but I think over time we'll see more and more of them that are going to allow you to really manage your entire financial life right, right, right here, which, which will be remarkable. But as Bill said, it's not really what you make, it's what you save, it's what you save and spend. And so I have worked over the uh, you know, 25 years with people who make $80,000 a year and save 10, and I've worked with people who made literally, I'm not kidding, a million a year and just tell me where's the fact, I, I can't save anything, and help me, I can't. And you feel like kind of an idiot going over, <laughs> going, well, here's someplace, and then they're like, I can't get there. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it really is possible for anyone to save, and there's a, um, one of the online firms right now called LearnVest.com. Um, they focus pretty much on budgeting, and I think what they essentially say, and I, I don't disagree with it, and it is probably pretty as straightforward as this, 50, 20, 30. Make sure, build your life, so that no more, of your, no more than 50% of, uh, of your income goes to the essential expenses, like your mortgage, like your rent, like transportation and food, those sort of essentials. 20%, which seems like a high number, I'm sure, but it's probably around the right number. 20% should be set aside for future you. Uh, and pretty much what that means is the you that's going to be probably 60 years or older. Set that aside now, just get into that habit. And then that 30% is sort of your lifestyle. Uh, so 50, 20, 30, uh, it's probably a pretty good rule of thumb. The only, now I'll jump ahead to Bill's comment about retirement and uh, he said what you would typically read in most places, this idea that people quote unquote retire at 65. Um, that worked back in the day when you retired at 65 and were dead by 67. You know, you didn't have to save as much money. And it also worked in a world where companies provided pensions for you. But now, if you're going, it's almost mathematically impossible, unless you're really lucky, like literally put all your money in, into the next apple and it becomes the next apple rather than a company that fails and you lose all your money, which is the problem of not being diversified. Um, uh, it's almost mathematically impossible now to be able to set aside enough during your working career to make sure that if you retire, for example, at 65, that you have enough money to age 95. Um, it's, just, it's just too hard to do. So what people are doing is, in general, working longer uh, or come retirement they might do part-time work, uh, or they might do a second career. Uh, I, th I don't know. I don't know what it is in medicine. I know in sort of uh, teaching and economics and, and, and lawyers that often work into their 80s. And that makes a huge difference because you're not drawing down money from 65, 66, 67. You're not drawing that money down. In fact, that money that you're not drawing down is continuing to grow, right, until you actually do need to grow it down. It makes a huge difference. So I think that people now who are statistically going to live longer have to think now about that investment bill we were talking about earlier, which is your human capital. You're investing right now in your education, right? But I think you, you want to continue to take a look at that as you get older and continue to invest somehow in your human capital. Maybe. Uh, it's a second career. Maybe it's a hobby that you want to do for money so that you're not drawing it down. Maybe it's continuing in the medical, pra medical practice. I don't know. But I think we have to sort of l think about retirement differently these days than people used to do. So that, that's one thing. I also want to make sure I give you a couple resources um, that at least at the moment I think might be helpful to you. Not in terms of answers, but in terms of how to think about things. And one is, um, I listen once a week to the Freakonomics radio podcast uh, that, that Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner, Stephen Levitt, a University of Chicago economist, uh, I think their first book probably was out in 2005, maybe, something like that, called Freakonomics, The Hidden Side of Everything, and then there was Super Freakonomics, and now their book out right now is called Think Like a Freak. And it's basically the kind of thing to get you thinking critically. Um, Problem is you don't always know what you don't know, right? So when I tell you, for example, people will come to you and talk to you 
about uh, cash value life insurance and that it'll sound like a great deal because you only get one side of the story. It's, it's hard to know the other side of the story. It's hard to find the other side of the story. Uh, so it's not always easy, but if you're thinking critically, it may help you ask those questions. Okay, this all sounds very good. What could go wrong? That's an easy question. That's a question to ask financial planners and advisors all the time because that's not the part they're generally going to want to talk about. Another good question that we get from time to time, and that's when you know you have a sort of educated uh, client, is when they say, what am I not asking? What am I not asking that I should? Uh, or if I knew more, what I asked? That's a very legitimate question. So what, what, how could this go wrong? And I think, I, I, I'm not saying this to set up a lawsuit or anything, but I think having asked those two questions, if they're not answered honestly and fully, uh, you may have a case in arbitration, right? If something does go wrong, I specifically asked what could go wrong, and he said, she said, nothing, or this, and that's not true because if if we go to securities law, securities law uh, fraud is not only a, a material misrepresentation, but an omission, right? Now they may omit something because actually they don't know it. Uh, that's fine too, uh, but it's still, you've asked that question, so that would be a piece of advice that, that I would give you. Um, let me just jump quickly to 401ks uh, or retirement plans and um, investing. Uh, Warren Buffett, who you've, who's heard of Warren Buffett? A couple of people. Uh, Warren's done okay for himself. and. Um, the first rule in our book, Three Simple Rules, is simplify, keep it simple. Uh, and he's a great example of that, and I'll tell you why. Um, he, in his will, has, ins has instructed his trustees on how to invest his fortune after he dies. Does anyone have any guesses what he is recommending? How he is advising his trustees to invest his money? I'll give it quickly. Uh, he said, uh, put 10% uh, uh, of my money in cash and put 90% of my money in the Vanguard Total Stock Index Fund, period. So this is with a, probably the most respected investor out there, and that's what he's doing. That's it. And I'm going to tell you that you can do something like that as well. I know there are characteristics that might be different about you for more, but uh, it's just as effective. And then you can go on being a doctor and living your life and doing whatever you want to do because you're not futzing around with crazy uh, strategy schemes and um, things like that that at the end of the day don't add value. And Warren knows it. Um, and that's how he's telegraphing it. One mutual fund. Now, I might argue if you're picking one mutual fund, you pick the uh, total world stock index fund instead of the total U.S. stock fund. But I think Warren's being a patriot when he does that. Um, I think we can all recognize that sometimes empires collapse, um, and sometimes it's because they overreach. Not that not that the U.S. would ever overreach. Um, but I think the total world might be a, a, a safer long-term bet. Uh, so rule number one is simplify, and you really can be that simple. And it, there's the temptation always to do more. If I do more, I will do better, right? Uh, if I follow this strategy, or if I have a, but basically what you find uh, when you even look at hedge fund data, for example, that over the last 10 years, hedge funds have returned $79 billion to their investors, which is phenomenal, and $350 billion to the hedge fund operators. So they know how to make money, but not in the market, they, they make money off of you. Um, and so Bill mentioned Vanguard earlier uh, as a fund complex, and of course Warren has spe is specified a Vanguard fund. And Vanguard is one of the only mutual fund companies in the world that you are an owner. When you own shares in, in a Vanguard mutual fund, you are one of the owners. And because you're one of the owners, there's not a third party, right, that's got its hand out for some profit. Any sort of profit that the mutual fund can do by lowering expenses just gets plowed into lowering your expense ratio. Any mutual fund, which is a pooled investment account, a mutual fund is uh, you, we all get together and we hire a manager. Basically, that's a mutual fund. A mutual fund is a registered form of that. If everybody in this room said, let's throw in some money, we'd all own a proportionate share of it. We'd tell the manager, this is how we want the money man managed, this is our objective. Think of it that way. Now, we're going to have to pay that manager, right? So, we're going to come up with a deal and 
he, he or she might, you know, want more resources, might want access to Reuters, might, might want a subscription to the Wall Street Journal, whatever it is. So they're gonna be expenses. Every mutual fund has an expense ratio, and every expense ratio is in the prospectus. And what studies have shown over time is that the best predictor of future performance is not past performance. In fact, that's on all the prospectuses. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. But nobody believes that, of course, right? If I came to you and I said, here is a terrible investment over the last five years, but I think it's going to do well, you will not invest in it, I assure you. And if I come to you and say, look, this has been one of the best mutual funds over the last five years, you will. Despite the fact that everything has shown that past performance is, is non-correlated to future performance. Um, what is correlated with future performance is expenses. Uh, you can almost go out there and find the lowest expense mutual fund and just invest in that. And I'll give one example of one study. Morningstar uh, is a, a large company that rates mutual funds. They rate over 10,000 mutual funds and they've got analysts and they've been around forever. Clients use them, invest, uh, investment advisors use them. And they rate funds with one, two, three, four, five stars, right? So five star fund is a great fund, or at least was over the last period, three to five years. Four star, almost three, okay, average, and then the other two. What they've shown on repeated studies is that if you invest in a five star fund today, it has just as good a chance five years from now of being a five, four, or three. And if you invest in a three star fund today, it has just as good a chance of being a five, four, three. So there's no, there, there's no predictive value, might be the other way of putting that. Not zero. Zero predictive value. And everybody acts as though there is very, total predictive value. So it's insane. Uh, but, uh, but expenses do matter, and I'll do, I'm only going to do one thing here, and I'm looking at the time too, and I, I know it's coming up at 7.30. Um, so let me get to the second rule. The second rule is look all, only forward. And we're not really talking about predict the future. We're talking about ignore the past, because the past is irrelevant. What happened over the last 60 years in terms of the U.S. stock market has no bearing on what has to happen over the next 60 years, right? Um, over the last 60 years, we were rebuilding Europe. Uh, China was not competing. India was not a market. Those things have all changed. Uh, so what reason do we have to expect that our economic environment would be the same? So things can change. Um, and past is not always prologue. And past is also kind of tricky because the past is not monolithic, right? There's not just one story of the past. The past teaches us many lessons, and many of them are contradictory. So, you know, then you're down to deciding which past do I believe, and that's a judgment call. Uh, and if you're wrong, you go bankrupt, right? And so it's not really a game you want to play. Uh, but by being fully diversified with a very inexpensive total U.S. stock market fund or total world stock market fund, you're participating in the growth wherever it occurs. Uh, did you have a question? No? Okay. Um, so the third rule of investing is tune out the noise. Um, you might remember a book that came out years ago called uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. So when we say turn out the noise, we're saying tune out the noise, and it's all noise. Um, I do not read the Wall Street Journal every day. I do not read Barron's. I do not read, you used to be like, it's almost um, malpractice not to in a way it seems, right? But, uh, but it's not, really, because those things are going on. There are people on Wall Street trying to figure out what to pay for Coca-Cola. What should be the price of Coca-Cola, right? Uh, and that, with all of them bidding against each other, you come up with something called a price. And we can all see the price on our quotrons and tickers. You can look it up at any given time. What is the price of Coca-Cola? But that price has been arrived at by millions of different decisions. Decisions by Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Citibank. 98, 5% or more of the trading on Wall Street is done by institutions. So every time you're thinking, this is a good bargain, I think Coke should be 30, uh, or Coke, Coke should be 40 and it's selling at 30, what, it's, just think of hubris, basically, because what you're saying is, I know more than Goldman. Every time you think you know more than the market, just think of it that way. I know more than Goldman. I know more than Citi. I know more than JP Morgan. Not only that, not only do I know more than they do, but I'm saying that not even knowing what they know, right? Uh, and if, if J.P. Morgan thought that Coke should be at 40 and it was at 30, it would be at 39. Because you would just put all your money there. You would double down, you would leverage it up because it's a guaranteed win. These people fight over milliseconds 
for millipennies uh, on Wall Street. And so the idea that there's this huge gap that you've discovered that they're completely unaware of around the world with hedge fund managers and looking for all sorts of arbitrage with all the PhDs and physics, physicists and all that, don't bother. Let them find it out and then free ride, which is what indexing is, passive investing, free ride on all the work they're doing. Uh, you're just going to save yourself a lot of time, a lot of headache, and a lot of money. So I want to, you know, Bill talked about uh, Einstein's uh, uh, compound interest being the eighth wonder of the world. Um, now, <clears throat> the reason, well, that's true, by the way, um, but what people don't think about is the compounding effect of fees. For some reason, this industry has gotten away with uh, asset-based pricing. So if you come to a financial planner and say, you know, will you help me? Typically, the answer will be yes. Okay, what do you charge? Well, we're fee-based. We charge 1% of your assets under management, 75 or 3 quarters of a percent, or maybe 1.5% of your assets under management. And if you go to 10 other financial planners or investment advisors, they're going to give you the same answer. It's, it's an industry standard to be asset-based. But it's a little bit like going to your accountant or having your accountant come to you and, and, and say, uh, I'll do your taxes. What's your house worth? You know, I'll charge based on that. Uh, we don't do that with accounts. Typically, we, we say, well, how long is it going to take you? And then charge me per hour, that kind of thing. Asset-based pricing is pernicious because it seems so low and it's so common. Uh, somehow the industry's gotten away with it, but it's so dangerous over time. And one of the reasons um, it works very well, it's a little bit like tax withholding, um, and if you own a mutual fund and there's an expense ratio of 1.25%, your expenses are taken out daily at the end of the day. Taken out. They don't send you a bill. They're not debiting your checking account, right? So you'll never see this happen, but it happens. But it's not painful, right? Um, and then if you have an advisor, typically, and you're paying them 1% of assets under management, again, which is very common, uh, once a quarter, there'll be a deduction from your account. You're probably not going to write a check. You probably won't even notice it. You're too busy. You get the statement. You won't notice it, and you paid it. Um, but what I'll show you right now is how that affects you over time. So compounding can be your friend, right? If you're getting six, seven, eight percent on your money over time, the one dollar a day growing to a million, right? That's the effect of compounding. But if you're having small leakage due to fees, and I'm going to argue unnecessary fees, by the way, uh, I just want to show the the effect of that. We just put a fee calculator on the side. Now this is fifty thousand. I'll just make it a hundred because we, then we can think of it in terms of hundred thousand dollar units. So a hundred thousand dollar investment you've got in a mutual fund over thirty years, rate of return eight uh, percent. Let's say your mutual fund fees were one and a quarter percent, if you can see that, and then you're paying your advisor one percent to help you put together an asset allocation. The total earnings over the thirty years would be a million bucks. You'll get to keep half of that. Doesn't that feel good? You'll keep half of that. The mutual fund will have taken $94,000. Fees that have come out daily that you've never noticed, right? And the advisor will pay $75,000. And a lot of people, by the way, are so thrilled when their investment advisor takes them to the Kennedy Center for a show or takes them, to the <laughs> <laughs> or takes them out golfing at a nice club or something like that. And they develop this incredible rapport by, be, by doing these huge, just tremendously wonderful things for you. Um, but I would argue <laughs> that with $75,000, you could play around a golf yourself with your own friends. Uh, you could get a box at the National. So, so people don't think of it that way. But here's the killer. Here's the killer. Here's the killer. Spending that $94,000, spending that $75,000 has cost you invisibly $300,000 that you didn't earn because that money was not in your account because it went out in fees. And that's the invisible hidden fee uh, that you really will, n most people never think about, but it's, it's just as real as, it, as though you've paid it. So that's one of the reasons you want to you want to focus on fees. So let's say that you had a very simple Warren Buffett-like plan, and you said, "I don't need an advisor to do that." Warren's not having an advisor, uh, and then you said, "Okay, he's using the total the Vanguard total stock index fund." Well, what's that? That is point oh one, oh one, no point one. Sorry, uh, I'm gonna have to redo this in a second. Okay, 
I think the picture's better. Frankly, I think you, you found a way to keep more money. So now, at your retirement, instead of having a half a million dollars in your account, you have a million dollars nearly in your account. Uh, effortlessly. Effortlessly. So what investment advisors are going to tell you, I can promise you, I'm in, I, look, I'm, I'm like a reformed investment advisor. I've done this for quite a while. <laughs> I, I, I'm now writing uh, an e-book to follow up this called Confessions of an Investment Advisor. And it's not confessions like we did things wrong. It's just, uh, I was an English major at Georgetown and I went in and I, uh, I was brought in and they trained you that this was true, this was true, this was true. And then over time you're like, well, well that, that's not true. And then, oh, that's not true. And then that's not true. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that we would, we would charge 1% of assets under management to help people find the best managers. And people would want us to do that. Uh, but the bottom line is, is if we pick 10 managers for somebody's portfolio, a small cap manager, a large company stock manager, a bond manager, Every quarterly meeting or every annually me annual meeting, you know, four of our picks underperformed. Underperformed uh, just an index, a, ba a basic index. And so what we would do uh, to keep in all good is we would get rid of those four, and then we would put in four who had done well for the last five years. <laughs> because then somebody could feel good about having ten managers who've done well the last five years. Had nothing to do with what's going forward. Uh, so it's a, it's a very persuasive shell game. Um, and I don't think people are doing it to be a shell game. So this is not an indictment of the integrity of financial planners. It's a little bit how um, people would say, you know, 99% of people hate Congress, but uh, like 90% of the people like their um, congressman, that kind of thing. Um, it is not an indictment of financial planners or investment advisors. I actually think that some people don't know uh, what they're doing, which is a large. Some people kind of know, but think in the end, well, I'm net that I'm helping people, uh, so this is okay. And then there are probably people who are like, mm, this is not so good, but okay, I make a good living. Um, I, I, and I don't know where people fall on uh, fall in that. But I, I will say this: that um, many of my friends on Wall Street who make money on Wall Street uh, do invest in index funds and passive funds for their own money. Um, so I think that's sort of where the proof is in the pudding. Um, so I think it's an important thing to know about fees. Um, uh, and if you if, the, if you can walk away with one thing, it would be to be it, it would be to focus laser like on fees because the benefit over time to you is enormous, and the harm to you over time will be invisible. You won't even know how much more you could have had. <laughs> you just won't. Um, and that's, I think that's why it perpetuates, frankly. But, uh, so, that, uh, so on investing, keep it simple. You can really put together as good a portfolio as anyone else is out there with as few as one, but well, let's say three holdings. And you can be as diversified as anybody with just those three holdings, right? That's a holding. Uh, holding would be, let's, um, uh, let's say you have $100,000 and you don't want to put $100,000, all of it, 100% of your assets, in one mutual fund that is investing in stocks. It's not the one mutual fund. That's not the issue. The issue is stocks. Because you could put 50000 in a bond fund, 50000 in stock funds. And stock funds and bond funds have different characteristics. Uh, a bond fund tends to be, although this is not always true, tends to be less volatile. right? So you're, you, you, you want a smoother ride. You might, at the end of the day, earn less. Frankly, you might earn more. Uh, uh, the 30-year period ended 2009, maybe 2010. Bonds outperform stocks. Um, people always think stocks for the long term, right? That's as you told that all the time. Stocks for the long term, and they accept that we just passed the 30-year period where bonds trounce stocks. So it's not quite true. So you might do it for diversification reasons. You might own two mutual funds, each of which I would call a holding. Um, if you own, own a mutual fund, another mutual fund, and then Apple, I'd say you have three holdings, Apple stock, three holdings. So it's sort of any security, any one security that you own. But when you own one stock, when you own Apple, you have significant business risk, right? It could, he could win or lose. After all, when, when, when Jobs was kicked out of Apple, he went and built Next, which was a disaster. And then just as they were hemorrhaging money, he went and bought Pixar. And he bought it for all the wrong reasons. He bought it, you know, if you read Isaacson's book, he bought it uh, you know, for graphic designers. 
And then there was this one guy over in the corner making cartoons. And he's like, hey, that's pretty cool, we can make cartoons. Uh, and then he forged something with Disney. So he was saved by you know, luck as much as anyone. Um, and then, of course, the ability to do iTunes was only because the music industry wouldn't get their shit together because they were all competing with each other. So he said, I'm a third party, and let's have deals with all that. He, wow. Now, you can say that it was really smart, but he was certainly wouldn't have mattered how smart if they would have just gotten their stuff together. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you own one stock, you have all that risk attendant with one company. When you own one total U.S. stock index fund, you don't own, you, you don't have any of that risk uh, because you basically own in aggregate uh, America's equity or the world's equity if you do it total. So, so simplify. You can keep it simple. And in those simple options, you can save a ton of money as well. It's almost twofold, except that it's a little bit cart and horsey because one of the reasons that an index fund will outperform most other things is because its expenses are so low. So it's, I don't know which one comes first. So you can have a very simple portfolio. Ignore the noise because you actually don't want to spend your time becoming a financial expert. You actually want to you know, practice and then have a family and do fun things. Um, I'm trying to think, a 401k. One thing, Bill said, oh, uh, there is a myth out there right now that you should always maximize your 401k. And Bill was right. It, to the extent that there's a match, you know, it's 100%, well, 50 or 100% return. Let's say that for every dollar you put in, your employer puts in a buck up to the first $6. That's 100% return. That's fantastic. Above that, you now have a choice. Because what you're going to do is you're going to trade expense, which we've now determined is important, right? Let's assume. You're going to trade expense for tax deferral, the benefit of tax deferral. And when you put in a 401k, yes, you get an upfront deduction, but at the back end, you pay tax. So it's not like you escape tax, although the Roth uh, is, a, is a great way to, to extend that. You're just getting a deferral element. Um, not that it's insignificant, but 401ks are notoriously expensive uh, with hidden expenses as well. There's, because there's the administration of a 401k, so they're paying record keepers. They're, they're, they have to do some sort of compliance testing and things like that. And the investment industry has figured out this is one area, because of the myth, always maximize, that people are putting money into irrespective of fees. They're not fee conscious. Plus, your employer only gives you X amount of choices, right? Maybe 10 or 15 or 20 mutual funds. So your choices are limited. You can't go outside that 401k. You're a captive audience. So the industry loves 401ks and they love to bury fees there. So the, the effective fees can overwhelm the tax advantages. Um, where that number is, is hard to say. It's probably around one and a quarter percent, but you're not gonna see those fees anywhere. Uh, you're each, when you have four or five investment options, each one of those investment options you can look at the fees, but you'll never know the behind the scenes cost. The Department of Labor is trying to fix that with more transparency, but the industry owns Congress, so uh, that's slow going. Uh, anyway, I, so, so let's see. So I said Freakonomics. I think if, you, if you're gonna read a book, let me think. Uh, the Success Equation uh, by Michael Mobison. It's called Untangling Skill and Luck in uh, Business, Sports, and Investing. He's actually Georgetown class of 86. He was a chief investment strategist at like Mason and now he's up at Credit Suisse. But basically he talks about different domains where there's luck and skill. Let's use one example. Chess playing might be skill. Uh, flipping a coin is luck, right? So where does investing fall on that continuum? If this is luck and this is skill, where does investing fall? And he has coin flip right here. And let me show you where investing is. Okay. <laughs> so, so people are paying 1% a year for magic. For, for luck. Uh, you might as well take the luck on your own and don't pay that, right? Uh, so that's one good book. Uh, think Like a Freak, as I said, in the Freakonomics podcast. And I think if you could read The Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, that might be another one that's worth just foundationally thinking about uncertainty. And, um, and it, I think it'll help you be a little more critical. It's a little bit, little bit more critical. It's a little bit like asking those two questions I said earlier, which is what is the question I'm not asking and what could go wrong with this? And I think if you're armed with that, whether it's an insurance agent or a financial planner or an investment advisor, because that's the information that will not flow freely from the mouth. And it's also your, I think it's your back end ticket if you screw because you did ask that. Any questions? I'm surprised by how much I agreed with Bill, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank you. Um, 
couple of things. I do have a copy of this. It's Tax Breaks for College Students. It was in the Wall Street Journal, but it applies to some of you that maybe go out to residency and paying loans and stuff. And the other is, um, and this is only if you want it. Um, I've got 10 copies. The Office of Plan Giving hands out a book called Wealth and Families. It's about philanthropy, but about a third of the book is about the psychology of money uh, and philanthropy. And I used to use this in practice and give it to parents on how to teach their kids about money and the value of money and what wealth was that's not just the money, it's the wealth of the relationships and the other things we talked about. So I've got some of these. If you really want to take one, otherwise I've got to give them back to Steve. And then, awesome. uh, I'll say one more thing. It's a, sort of a shameless plug, but I will. Um, uh, my you shameless? Yeah. My co-author, Michael, and I now started, uh, I guess in July, a um, semi-daily uh, blog called The Frank Insight of the Day. And basically, a lot of times what we do is we, we read something in the mainstream press that is nonsense, um, and we basically write about, okay, this is nonsense, and here's why. So you have a chance to sort of read articles that may, if you read them on your own, just sound like they made tremendous sense. Uh, but see how somebody with other knowledge might be able to read them more critically. And it might serve as a way to sort of help you train yourself to not take certain things on face value. And our business is so very good at that. You will read an article and go, of course, of course you would buy low, sell high. Well, all you have to do is find the right company and the good management team, and I'll be rich. Um, and it's just harder than that. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and if you want these, uh, take a copy. Okay. Thank this you. was fun, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.